Hey guys, thank you for inviting us. Thank you for inviting us into your living room today. My name is Ingrid Lemmy and this is my show, American Dream. A show about people, their hopes, their dreams, their family heritage, and their unbelievable realities. And my guest today here at Gurney Zinn, overlooking the ocean, is my American Dream man, Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> Yes, guys. Yes, he is the, the very Bill O'Reilly, the one you are seeing every night in your living room at 8 o'clock, wh whatever time, wherever you are, whatever time zone, there he is <laughs> at 8 o'clock. Bill O'Reilly had his dream, his American dream, and he made it all become reality with the help of a few people along the line. And guess what, guys? He's here today because he promised me a few years ago to make my American dream come true and be on my dream show. And uh, that is absolutely amazing. No, it's my pleasure, Ingrid. I, you know, <laughs> you're a nice person and do a nice show, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bill, um, of course, it's about a bold, fresh piece of humanity that you are. I am. You indeed are. <laughs> because sometimes I'm watching you at night, and I think, holy... Don't say Schmally. it. <laughs> so, Bill, um, starting with uh, Levittown. Yeah, I was brought up in Levittown. My father was from Brooklyn. My mother was from New Jersey. And uh, they met in Cambridge, Massachusetts in World War II. Mm. My father was a naval officer. And my mother was at Boston University studying to be a physical therapist. And they met at St. Paul's, a social at St. Paul's Church. Uh, and subsequently, many years later, I attended Harvard, and I went over to St. Paul's and just kind of checked out how they met and all of that. And then after World War II, my father came back and married my mother, and uh, they moved out. Do you out. remember where he was in World War II? Where yeah, he was in the uh, occupation in Japan. And my father was a naval officer. Mm -hmm. So if they hadn't dropped the atom bomb, he would be dead. I wouldn't be here yes. because he would have been in the invasion force, and it would have been catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, so he was in Tokyo Bay and uh, then he came back and they, uh, they got married and Levittown was a big, big uh, housing development as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, set up for mostly GIs coming back from the war. Mm -hmm. Very inexpensive housing and they got out there and uh, there I was. I came a couple of years later. Yes. Bill was born. Bill was born and Bill was definitely your mother's how do we say that? Apple of the eye, she adored little Bill. Well, my mother was a very, uh, is still alive, still lives in Levittown, a uh, very nice person. My father's a little volatile, uh, Irish guy, um, but it was a good blend. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I was never spoiled by my mom. You know, if I, didn't, uh, if I didn't do the right thing, my mother reminded me of where that was. But she cooked for you. Uh, yeah, if you want to call it that. <laughs> And we have uh, SpaghettiOs and fish sticks, just like everybody else had, you know? <laughs> See, I never knew. It, 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 I, I guess m many people are like this. I never knew that growing up, I, and my circumstances were humble, yeah. all right? But my father had a decent job, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. But I never knew growing up that I didn't have a lot of stuff, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, because everybody was like me, a very ethnic neighborhood. Tell all, me about your neighborhood. Well, it was all white because at that time on Long Island was segregation, but it was Jewish and Irish and Italian and Polish and everybody mixed in, but mostly these people were from the city. They were city people. So you just kind of moved that sensibility out. And it was a little rough. I mean, you know, you, you got you to handle yourself and uh, with a lot of back and forth. I really had a great time as a kid, but I was you, rambunctious. You, you got some great games out there. Uh, you yeah, guys we, uh, played a lot of games. No play dates. We just went out and my... Uh, my mother would say, uh, be back uh, when the street lights come on. That was my, uh, that was the, that was the order. And they had no idea where I was, yeah. uh, you know, uh, particularly my father. My father really didn't care where I was, you know, just don't. He basically said to me two things, don't get arrested and pass. That's all. <laughs> that was his good. thing. Don't get arrested and pass. Yeah. Pass your subjects. Yep. Uh, so we went out and we, uh, you know, play. I, I used to climb trees 50 feet up and hang down, you know, like today parents would be, They'd be having heart attacks. We didn't have bike helmets. I played hockey. We didn't have 
any masks and or And guess anything. what? And we drank water from the water hose. Yep, water from the water there hose. There were and no and bubbles. It's just amazing we're still alive. Um, <laughs> yes. Compared to the kids today, where they're kind of coddled all the way through. But it was fun. And, and I, I learned how to handle myself and how to survive conflict. Bill, there is an amazing, funny story. The story about the alarm clock. Oh, yeah. Please, um, please tell us this story. There was always tension between the kids in the neighborhood and, and some of the uh, homeowners mm -hmm. who had their lawns and their flower beds, and we did not respect any boundaries. Of course so not. So when we were playing games, we'd run across the lawns, or the ball would go on the lawn, and we'd run up and get it. And, you know, kick some flowers over, whatever. So this one guy, he was a real pain for us. Every time the ball would go on his lawn, he would try to run out and take the ball. Um, Very quickly. Yeah, and I went, you know, come mean. on. All you we're doing mean. is playing a little stick ball in the street, and this idiot is taking the ball, and we're looking at the guy. So one night we decided to get him. He had a, a couple of babies, uh, very uh, young kids. And uh, so we hatched a plot where the smallest guy in the gang, a guy named Dave McDevitt, would shimmy up a tree, and the tree was right next to his bedroom, <laughs> right outside. And those days, nobody had air conditioning. This was the middle of summer. Nobody had air conditioning, yeah. so the windows were all open. Uh -huh. And the tree was like maybe two feet from his window. I like it. So I had this old alarm clock uh, that just was the loudest thing in the world and rang forever. So I got the alarm clock. I gave it a day. We had the masking tape. We set it for midnight. He ran up about 20 minutes to midnight. Of course, we all snuck out of our houses to do this because this was a big caper. We had planned this for a month. Yeah. He tapes it to the tree. Yeah. All right. He shimmies down. We're all across the street hiding in the bushes. <laughs> and it struck at midnight. This thing goes off like uh, New Year's Eve. Yes. All the lights go on, not only in his house. Everybody's Everywhere. happy. The whole day of Kids all. are crying, babies yeah. screaming, everybody's going crazy. Of course, we thought this was great. Yeah. What a cape. <laughs> Until we heard the police sirens. Yeah. Then we went, maybe uh -oh. this wasn't such a good idea. Yes. So then we scatter. I mean, everybody bolts back home. Again, this was a time when doors were not locked, mm -hmm. windows were open. So my house, I, I lived, my bedroom was upstairs, and the back door, I could just get in and get up. So my parents, they would never know, which I did. I just got in, crept up the stairs, threw up my clothes, jumped in. But this was huge. I mean, it must have been uh, 10 squad cars, everybody. Around. Because the thing was still ringing. They couldn't find it. There's flashlights all over the place. It's a what funny is this story. Thing, you know, it's a funny that. story. Yeah. So the next day, I mean, obviously, I was the ringleader uh, of every, all of this crazy stuff. So suspicion fell on me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I denied everything, which is the first rule of Levittown. Mm -hmm. You didn't do it, no matter I what. Didn't Even do if it. they caught you doing it, you didn't do it. You're hallucinating. It's not really me. It's my evil twin. Whatever you, you had to say. <laughs> so they never got us. They never got us. And that guy never knew who did it until this book came out. No! <laughs> <laughs> On the American Dream Show at Gurney's Inn in Montauk, overlooking the ocean, Bill O'Reilly. Can you believe it, guys? Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> and he's here. And I am so, so unbelievable excited. You know what? If I drop that tomorrow, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you made my life. Guys, we are um, go moving on in Bill's life, and Bill is going to school. I went to St. Bridget's School, which is a lot of uh, bull fresh is about the nuns and me mm -hmm. and my, uh, you know, relationship with them, which was a kind of a love-hate relationship. Um, That's I don't where know the where the love is, is but I know right? it was there somewhere. <laughs> I actually didn't, yeah. I liked the nuns. She liked you. She must have liked you because she didn't call uh, you anything bad. She well, called you a bold, fresh I, they, piece of I them. annoyed them. I'm annoying, and I'm still annoying, <laughs> but I annoyed them. That, that's what it was all about. I wasn't malicious or anything like that. So I went to St. Bridget's, and then my father um, realized that I was pretty much out of control. So I wanted to go to the public high school because uh, that's where all my friends were going. Uh, but he insisted I go to Chaminade High School, which mm -hmm. is a Catholic boys' school in Mineola, which is very strict and regimented, so off I went. Um, it was smart to put me in there. I didn't like you it. But you know, today it was tough. you think it right. was... But, you know, the discipline that the, mm -hmm. they imposed on me, and I, I needed that at that point in my life. And then I graduated from Chaminade. I went to Marist College, uh, primarily to play football. 
Um, and then I went to the University of London mm -hmm. uh, my third year. And in fact, next week, this time next week, I will be back in London for my 40th reunion at the University of London. It. It's amazing. Um, so I spent third year abroad over in London, and then I came back and uh, graduated from Marist and was a high school teacher for two years down in Miami in a tough, uh, tough neighborhood in Miami. Bill, let, let me just go back to London. Um, there was a time where you really got challenged in regards to being American. Yeah, well, I was a Vietnam. Uh, era and there was a lot of anti-American feeling over there. Um, I dealt with it all right, um, but it, that was a turning point in my life because I had not been um, subjected to any kind of culture other than Long Island. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was talking like this, hey, mm -hmm. how you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and they're looking at me like, what, mm -hmm. what is this? So um, when I went to London and got to an opportunity to travel all over Europe and down to Morocco and all, and all of this stuff, the world opens up. Sure. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot going on that I really didn't know. That was a turning point. And then I came back to Marist my senior year and uh, finished up. And then, as I mentioned, went to teach high school for a couple of years. After high school, I knew I didn't want to be a teacher forever. I liked it. Mm -hmm. And it was certainly, it certainly is a worthy profession. I admire teachers very much because they don't make a lot of money. But, boy, if you get a good teacher, you can affect a kid sure. forever. Dramatically. So these, these people do very, very good work. But I knew that there was something more. So I went back to Boston University, where my mother had attended, and I uh, got a master's in broadcast journalism, mm -hmm. and then started my career. Um, and then, interestingly enough, about 20 years later, uh, I went back to school, to Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, to the Kennedy School of Government, to get another master's degree, mm -hmm. because I knew that I had reached a level in, in television, and I needed to get a little bit more credential to get into the commentary that I do now. So that's my education. Mm -hmm. Education not only in regards to school, but also you traveled all over the world. 75 countries. Okay, and that's something what we sometimes forget when we see him every night on television. He has been there. No, I've been there. The events when they happened, the wars, whatever, you have been well, there. Well, that really separates me from most of these other uh, bloviators. I bloviate, but uh, <laughs> you know, I bloviate about stuff I've seen. They bloviate about stuff that they haven't. I covered four wars. I was down in El Salvador uh, in the 80s. Then I went over to the Falkland Islands War, covered it from uh, Buenos Aires and Montevideo. Uh, then I went to uh, Israel and covered that. And then I went to Northern Ireland and uh, covered that. So I, uh, I've seen the best and the worst, mm -hmm. and uh, I know At the At times, world. dangerous situations. Yeah, it was dangerous. I almost got killed a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, but, Is there um, one situation in particular that yeah, you Yeah, and, and, and when the uh, Argentines surrendered uh, to the British, uh, there were riots in the streets of Buenos Aires. I write about this in my novel, Those Who Trespass. Um, and I was out there pretty much by myself because the other CBS news correspondents were hiding mm -hmm. in the hotel. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, wait, you, you got to get out and cover the story, mm -hmm. which I did. Um, but when the riots broke out in uh, the Casa Rosada, the, that's where the presidential palace is, the people were kind of storming the presidential palace because they were so angry that they had lost face, that they had lost to the British. So it must have been five or 6,000 people. And the army was standing between the people and the presidential palace. And they were, here in the United States, we would do tear gas and rubber bullets. They were doing real bullets. They okay. were just gunning these people down, shooting them down in the street. So you could have so gotten killed. I was there uh, uh, watching this from, the, from about 50 feet away from where the army was shooting. Um, now, you got to understand it. When you're in a El Salvador or Argentina or even Northern Ireland, you're on your own. I mean, there's no American. See, when I went to Afghanistan and, uh, and uh, Iraq with the factor, we had guys. We had American guys with us yes. wherever we were. I mean, we were in some dangerous places, but we had American soldiers around us. When I was down there, I was, you were by yourself, and nobody going to help you. Um, so anyway, uh, when the riots broke out, my, my shooter, my photographer, uh, got run over by the crowd. He got trampled by the crowd, and the camera went flying. And I saved the tape, because it was unbelievable tape, but I dragged him off the street, because he was bleeding from the ear, and he had hit his head on a, on a concrete. So I'm dragging him off the street and with one hand. I got the tape in the other hand. The sound man is trying to save the camera because CBS was not going to be happy to lose a camera. It was that yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah. And then the army comes running down, and the guy points the uh, M16 at our, you know, and I'm going, 
periodista no dispare, which means journalists don't shoot. I said, uh, por favor, <laughs> please don't shoot. Yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't begging. You beg and you're in trouble. This is interesting. Uh, ABC correspondent uh, named uh, Bill Stewart got shot in Nicaragua, got killed uh, by the Somoza people because they got him out of a car and they said, go down on your knees, and he did. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he did that, they shot him in the head because, and, and we were all sitting there going, what, what, what is that? If you do that in South America and other places in the world, you lose macho. Okay. And they lose respect for you. They lose your, okay. Now, a Jesuit priest told me that in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I was talking to the guy because these nuns had been slaughtered in El Salvador, and I was down there right after that. They shot like a dozen, killed a dozen nuns. And I'm saying, you know, I was talking to the Jesuit priest. He says, look, you know, this is really out of control down here. If you ever get caught by the uh, uh, guerrillas, don't ever go down on your knees. Yes. And don't ever beg or don't ever do anything to show no fear, yes. be respectful, look them in the eye, tell them who you are, and mm -hmm. shut up. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the best piece of advice I ever got. Because I looked that guy in the eye, the Argentine soldier. He must have been about 17. He was a kid, and, uh, and I looked him in the eye, and I spoke very slowly, a periodista, no dispare, por favor, senor. Uh, and then I pointed to the, my cameraman was South American. I pointed to him, you know, the guy's bleeding, because I was obviously helping him, and then the guy lowered his gun and then went away. But he could have easily wiped us right off the face of the earth. So that makes you think about a makes lot of things. It, <laughs> and yes. um, and um, that was the closest I ever really come to. And it's basically telling us all here, this is what journalism really is about. Well, you know, that's the interesting thing that I have going for me. Um, I got to see all of this stuff, and I'm the, one of the last ones, because they don't do that now. Yeah. The networks don't send people all over the world anymore. It's too expensive. And I got in on the last wave mm -hmm. of uh, being sent all over the place, learning about the world. And then I use all of that in my nightly presentation, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, and I think the credibility that I bring to the discussion is what the folks see. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to agree with me, and I don't care whether you do or not. I'm not trying to persuade anybody to do anything. That's not my role. My role is to watch the powerful. But when I say something, I, you know, we've been doing this 13 years. We've never had to retract a story ever mm -hmm. on the fact, ever. Bill, do you think you are opinionated? Uh, do I think, Ingrid? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I believe I'm a little opinionated. Right. And with that, guys, we're going to take a break. <laughs> guys, I am so excited. My adrenaline is pumping. I'm sitting here at Gurney's, the ocean in the background, <laughs> Bill O'Reilly next to me. Is that something or what, guys? <laughs> Holy schmoly. We are talking about Bill O'Reilly and his life. How many books did you actually write? I've written six nonfictions and two children's books and one novel. Mm -hmm. pretty, pretty good, mm -hmm. pretty good. You do every night a TV show. Right. And now comes the question. Are you doing several on one day or are you? No, we do live every night. You go every yeah, night. I, mean, we, I, I shouldn't say live, we do live on tape. We do between six and eight. Sometimes we do it live, depending mm -hmm. on the day. Mm -hmm. But no, we don't do it ahead. Because we have to be there uh, for whatever's happening that day. Yes. So basically, you are not really prepared uh, for a certain subject. Sometimes, yes, but most of the time, you basically just go. Yeah, it's day to day. We have a very good staff, and they are they are very good researchers. So um, that's never a problem. We're always prepared when we go on here. Mm -hmm. I never ever heard my father say anything good about any politician. Bill, ever, is this which is why I bring that sensibility. To yeah. the factor. Yeah. I'm, I'm skeptical about them all. Yeah. You know, I'm not rooting for any of them. I'm, I'm tough on them all. And I think I inherited that gene. Mm -hmm. But is that probably also where your feeling comes or you were saying comes from, you got to make your mind up. What side are you on? Well, you do, but you shouldn't be uh, rigid like I'm always on this side. Mm -hmm. You know, Nixon did some very good things mm -hmm. before he got caught up in this Watergate craziness. And Monica Crowley, one of our contributors, worked with Nixon um, at the end of his life. And she has an infinite amount of respect for the man. And I like Monica, and I, I, her judgment is good. So, you know, Nixon's got a bad rap. Bush did a lot of good things. Bush got a bad rap. So now we have Obama, and, you know, I'm, I'm critical of the president at times, but I'm not 
sledgehammering him. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm waiting to see mm -hmm. what exactly his policies are going to lead to. Now, if I disagree with his policies, I'm absolutely going to say it. But I'm not going to start to diminish or demean the man. I didn't do that to Bush. I didn't even do that to Clinton. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I didn't like the way Clinton handled himself, but I didn't personally attack him. And I think that separates me from a lot of the other people on radio and TV. You interviewed um, uh, Obama September yeah. 2000. A year ago. Yeah. One year ago. What did you think? What did well, you feel? A, you know, uh, the guy in uh, Time magazine uh, said that was the best interview Obama's ever done. Mm -hmm. He said that last week. And this guy hates my guts. So mm -hmm. uh, it was, must have been painful for him to write that. Um, that was a, a prize fight. Mm -hmm. That's what that was. And I've watched that interview a couple of times uh, since I've do, uh, done it. He didn't want to do that kind of an interview, but it was the middle of the Republican convention. And Sarah Palin had just come in, and everybody was all brain. So they knew they had to get back in the spotlight. And the way to do it is through my show. I mean, 25 million people watched that interview with mm -hmm, me, mm -hmm. far more than 60 Minutes or anything like mm -hmm. that. And that was all over the world. Now, he came in, and he was very well prepped on me. I mean, he, they had. He, he probably had studied you. He knew I played baseball. He knew, he knew everything. Mm -hmm. But when he came in, I, you know, stood up, and he was a senator at the time, and I was respectful to him. Um, and, and, but I could see that he was taking my measure. Mm -hmm. Now, if you saw the interview, we were fairly close together, and he, he would tap in me on the knee a couple of times, you know, uh, to make his point, which is fine. I don't want to do that. But it was like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And my interview uh, technique is different from the others because the others ask a question. They ask a question. And he, Obama, is prepared for all the questions, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't really do that. I give an opinion and say, what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Or I think you're screwing up on this. Mm -hmm. I don't say, well, what are you going to do if Iran does that? I don't do that. I say, so, like, and even with Bush, right? I interviewed Bush three times. I would go in and I'd say, you know, Iraq's a disaster. Why? Mm -hmm. And then So, you know, it's not like, where did it go wrong, Mr. President? It's Iraq's a disaster, mm -hmm. you know. You're putting it out. Right. I'm putting them right on the defensive. Obama did well. He, I beat him uh, by all accounts. But he did well. He held his own. Mm -hmm. So did Hillary Clinton when I interviewed her a few weeks later. They held their own. Mm -hmm. And that's all they had to do, was get out of that ring, not being knocked out. Mm -hmm. Now, does Obama want to come back to, with me? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> will, he, will he have to? Probably. He'll prob there'll probably come a time. Do you think he's scared? He, scared's not the right word. He's not physically scared of me. It's, if I go back to O'Reilly, and that's just not Obama. Mm -hmm. This is all of them. Mm -hmm. There's a big potential for disaster here. Mm -hmm. I know I can handle all these other guys because mm -hmm. they're never going to do what O'Reilly's going to do. Mm -hmm. So there, it's not like O'Reilly's going to be mean or going to be rude or, or do anything like that. But he right said, to the he's point. He's going to push you. He's going to push me, you know, to... to um, Get the answer. Right, like I did with Barney Frank the other night. <laughs> yeah. You we see know. that? Yeah. I, I asked him six times, <laughs> do you admire these two people? <laughs> And I just kept going back and mocking him because he wouldn't answer. And finally he goes, yeah, I admire him. Yeah. All right. That's me. I'm not going to let you go. And you didn't. No. I'm going to put you down. I'll ask you 15 times. So Obama's not afraid. It's just they calculate, is it worth this? What's the upside? What's the downside? They don't do it unless they have to do it. Now. Who's deciding that? The PR people? Yeah, Axelrod and Emmanuel and the guys that are inside the White House, um, they make the calculation of we need to do X now. Look, if Obama gets in any more trouble, if his, mm -hmm. if his approval is at 50% now, if it goes to 40, then he has to do it. Mm -hmm. has to come on to try to turn it around. By the way, approval. Uh, Bill, please tell us the, this insurance, this health insurance reform. What do you feel about that? Well, I'm not, first of all, I'm not an expert on that. So, I mean, I'm basically, I, I believe that the American public needs to have reasonably priced health insurance. That, I start from there. The folks need to be able to buy their insurance to protect their families. That's where I am. Now, I want to see the private sector try to do it first before these people come in. 
And uh, what I mean by these people are the federal government, look, I push for the border fence, you know, between Mexico and the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. I was the first one to really say, you've got to put up a fence. And I told Bush that. I said, you, got, you have to stop the madness. Now, they finally did, after four years of me kicking them, all right? Bush finally and Congress did. The cost overrun is now $6 billion. Yeah. Just to put the fence up, mm -hmm. all right? Now, just do the math here. If we're talking about a trillion dollars, for health care mm -hmm. government, mm -hmm. what do you think the cost overrun is going to be if they can't even build a fence down and there? And who's going to pay for it? Well, we're going to pay yeah. for it, yeah. but you, you want to stay away from this huge bureaucracy. Somehow Obama's convinced himself that the federal government's efficient. I mean, you know, I, the secret, maybe it's because, look, maybe it's because he lives in a White House. The Secret Service is efficient. They're the best in the world. His chef is the best in the world. The okay. food comes out, it's delicious. It comes out, it's not late. But he likes right? burgers. Whatever he likes, <laughs> yes. everything in his world works. Air Force One works, all the limos work, everything works. Yeah. So he's going, hey, this is really efficient. Yes. Now, you go over to the Department of Agriculture, it's a little bit different, okay? So he's convinced himself that the federal government, this huge apparatus, is going to be like really efficient. Yeah, we're going to wipe out all the waste and all the uh, corruption in, in the healthcare industry. Well, why didn't you do it? There was something else that didn't work. That was Katrina. What do you think why oh, that, that was, didn't you see, work? You see, that, that was Bush's fault because he, this is what I never got about George W. Bush. Look, when you have a catastrophe and people are dead in the street and, and children are running around and, and you got the news media and my, my, you get the hell down there mm -hmm. as fast as you can get down that there was you weird. roll your that sleeves was weird, up right? that yeah was and you get and you yeah. get in there with the waiters mm -hmm. and you're the president and you lead mm -hmm. that's what that was all about mm -hmm. he didn't do it waiters is good i right. wish he would have put you, on so the waiters yeah. you're leaving this in charge of a governor blanco i think that's what her name is who's a total nimcompoop and a criminal mayor Nagin, he's a crook, the other's a nincompoop, and they're running it? Boy. And then the feds come down and they don't know, oh my God, we were, in the news media, we were sitting there going, this is insane, this is like the twilight zone. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with, it? get down there, yes. all right? Mm -hmm. Get your people in there. And because that sends a message that we care, that we're gonna look at this every day, and everybody's scared. Look, I don't wanna make, grandiose claims or anything but if there's something going wrong on my show I don't send my lieutenants down I go down yes. and when that's I perfect. go down everybody goes holy you know what mm -hmm. this is serious that's the word we gotta fix say. it now Bill O'Reilly you have amazing beautiful blue eyes thank you I appreciate that. <laughs> two Irish parents will do that you know and I am so very sorry, but uh, they are going to cut me off now here. Guys, did he, I think he did a good job, right? Did he? Right. <laughs> Thank you.